Well, thank you, Eddie, for that. Uh, what a way to end up that session. Thank you that he didn't remind us that England lost to Ireland. <laughs> but, um, there we go. Yeah. Uh, again, again, yeah, cricket, rugby, good afternoon. Yeah. Um, if we have any speakers left in the room uh, from previous sessions, could they be kind enough just to come now up onto the stage? I saw Doug just now. Where's he gone? He came to get chocolate. <laughs> I see we've got Daniel at the back there. They're very used to speaking. They are. They're around. Come on, mate. Don't be shy. Don't be shy. I'm not a speaker, but I can sit in the chair. <laughs> <laughs> Neurotoxin, and your threshold after TM 
for coping with the effects of alcohol may be a bit different and you need to evaluate that. So the number of glasses before your walking is deteriorating, you're a bit more unsteady, a little bit more incoordinated, is actually probably going to be a little bit lower than Crutium. Yeah. Here's another alcohol expert on my right. <laughs> <laughs> Here's a patient. <laughs> Tell a story about somebody else. <laughs> no, so, uh, but we had a really well, a, a good friend of mine who was a patient of mine at, uh, in Baltimore. He has a really nice story. He's a, he had a TM uh, 15, 20 years ago, and he has a story. He a couple years ago he went drunk pretty badly somewhere overseas, and he converted the next day pretty much back to his condition that he was at this at his worst. So he was completely paralyzed. Usually he was walking. Okay. And it, it took him a day or two to recover from that. So you can actually, with alcohol, push you back into the previous deficit. So no more binging. <laughs> <laughs> right, there was a question, I think I saw a question. Yes, right at the very back. Right next to you. That's it. Thank you. Hello there. Um, I have two queries. Um, before I was admitted to hospital, um, I had a horrendous pain behind my right eye and I literally had to hold my eye because I thought it was going to pop out. Has that got anything to do with this? I've, I've never had any answers and it was really, really frightening. And also, can I just, before I forget, um, I've been told not to drink uh, diet drinks with aspartame in. I don't know whether anyone is aware of that. I don't, I don't really... I've just been told, and, and that's that. <laughs> Nothing at all. Did you tell I mentioned them? it, yeah, um, and it wasn't interested at all. Has anybody looked at your eyes? No, I haven't been to opticians either. <laughs> so there's some I've only had it for eight months, so it's still quite new. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, there, there's, there's some demyelinating conditions, like optic neuritis, that can be seen in a picture of TM, and then it's probably not TM, it's more some, something else in the demyelinating spectrum. So, I would ask your neurologist, maybe either send you to an ophthalmologist if he doesn't have the equipment in his practice, uh, or actually take a better look at your optic nerves <coughs> to see whether there is some evidence that you ever had some inflammation in, in your optic nerve, which might change the diagnosis you're carrying right now. Oscar um, Payne, I don't know, I haven't heard. I, I've, I've seen no data saying that people with TM shouldn't have a smart I see no data on that, so I don't understand the basis of that. Okay, that was just someone in passing, so thank you. Can I, can I ask a question? Um, a friend of ours who hoped to be with us today but can't um, has had TM for, I don't know how long has Piers had TM? Uh, about 10, 12 10, 12 years. years. <coughs> he, he thinks he's about to be diagnosed as a celiac, mm -hmm. and he wondered whether there was any chance of there being any link between the two? Yeah, so I mean, I suppose uh, autoimmune, autoimmune illnesses tend to cluster and uh, it is possible that, you know, TM is an autoimmune illness, polypostmodal, and uh, celiac is an autoimmune illness also can cluster. In particular reference to NMO, we know that uh, a good proportion of patients um, uh, can have other conditions and celiac is a prominent one. So we have five, these five patients who have the diagnosis of neuromyelitis optica who have celiac disease diagnosed and on treatment. And, and does one cause the other or is it just... They coexist. They coexist. Yeah. It's so you can't say that because he's got TM, that's why he's getting, becoming a celiac. Uh, or might he be so a celiac for quite a some time? Together. Right. It's the same white cells, but the target is the gut lining. Right. Than, and because so gluten and diet can make things worse. Sensitive, yeah. I'll remember that and pass it back to you. Hopefully, you've got your mom's jotting down the note about it. Yeah, I think she is. Great. Right, sorry, another question in the uh, third row back. Yeah. You haven't mentioned um, longitudinal extensive transverse myelitis. I know one of our um, 
people who are in the social support group does have that diagnosis to be told it's like a deviant or devex. You haven't mentioned it at all. Are you not mentioning it because you don't know very much about it? Or, <laughs> or is it NMO? Are you the person? Are you having, what, does it come between TM and NMO? It's somewhere in the middle, but you don't know very much. They're all passing the mic to me. <laughs> <laughs> so, so myelitis of any cause, um, actually, both TM myelitis or uh, most infectious myelitis, or vaccinal myelitis, any of them can have a long duration. Am I right? Yes. Yes. So, but, but in animal, uh, the myelitis is almost always long. So that is, that is what you mean by longitudinally extensive myelitis. While the typical MS myelitis is very short and it's a small area of the spinal cord. When you have a relapsing LETM, then the chances are that you probably have NMO or NMO spectrum disorder. So LETM is a, just a definition of a long myelitis for varied causes. If you have relapses of it, then you're likely to have NMO. Question right at that. Thanks, you, Barry. Yes. Hello. <laughs> um, my question leads on quite well to what you've just been dis discussing with the last two patients. Um, my daughter's got NMO. I'm not trying to recruit more NMO patients, honestly. Um, she's nine now, and she was diagnosed when she was four. But I was just wondering whether you think it would be, it is useful, or if it is already happening, that any patient presenting with a demyelinating condition should have their aquaporin 4 antibodies tested or is it not economical? Well, I, I, I can't kind of speak for the UK healthcare system but we, people come to my clinic, we, we send animal antibodies on everybody because we think it's, it's, a, it's a small chance and as, as we pointed out this morning, uh, we, should, we should take a look at that on everybody. We, we don't send it on every single female nation, but we certainly would send it for anyone that presents with optic uritis, anyone that presents with transverse myelitis, and certainly anyone that presents with you know both optic uritis and transverse myelitis um, at the moment. Um, that is the ideal situation. Yeah, they should be doing it just like any other um, antibody. You know, somebody comes with myelitis, we would do many antibodies, and. Uh, because they are partly because they are easily available and partly it's cheap to do. So in an ideal world, we should be testing anybody with TM or with for the antibody. Now, the, uh, perhaps the yield is going to be extremely low in people who have one, one myelitis and the scan shows MS appearance. So that group perhaps is not required. Very short segment of myelitis, perhaps the yield will be extremely low. But any other group, I think, is reasonable to say, particularly long myelitis, Severe optic neuritis, relapsing episodes. I think we should do an antibody. Yeah, thank you. Um, I wasn't asking for myself. I'm just asking for everybody else in the room. Basically, my daughter is antibody positive anyway. But I think five years ago, when she was first diagnosed with optic neuritis, they weren't really looking at tests in her then. It wasn't until she prevented with more symptoms. But probably there are patients in this room that might benefit. So you'll have an influx of referrals on Monday morning, I expect. <laughs> thank you all. <laughs> Because I 
eyes to very big. Little old horses. I'm just like to show you pictures of. So my life was changed dramatically in the night. But um, I think it's very important for friends and to the people you meet from your past to be upset to go to the National Junctions and the Arcos. I did want to see you in a wheelchair. It to begin with, and I thought, I'm going. Yeah. But I thought, right, you know, and I'm up. Somehow for me, it's one of the artists, one of the colours, one of the parents. <laughs> and I just think it's great fun. For me, I just went from the kids, see it, sort of shiny, lovely letters and so on. And this sort of thing. And it, it also makes people smile. And we mustn't think we can, you know, have to be down to all sort of things. You know. It's their problem with me. If people look at them, they go, what a thing. But uh, it's, you know, you can have fun, really. Uh, you know, it's, and it's awful in this part. Uh, but the, the main, sorry, the one thing I wanted to say was once, you know, you're lovely, uh, love, lovely, you're up, you know, this is not back. I know, I, instead of being sent to the spine, any spine of all the movement, I was sent to the geriatric which I had a good enough political feeling. And, uh, and I didn't know anything about the illness. So it was so scary because the even the visiting doctors to me said, we all had uh, chest infections twice in <laughs> 10 weeks. You know, and that lovely, the really and everything. Um, but uh, it just was, it uh, wasn't helpful to, when you die, you don't walk again. So we did refer then, uh, the biologists that had a list of uh, of the spine cord injury, losing it every time. So I just phoned up uh, 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 not to the street and said, Is there any way I can come to have help or help with walking? Because this is, you know, the, the people are there, but they're not the start. You know? I just needed to get as much help to understand it. And it's been, that was a real turning point. So really, I just wish that there could be more if the patients were sent. Or we even had someone to visit to explain, you know, we we'll had the time to come and say, well, look, this is what could happen. Oh, no, no. So I just wish there was an opportunity. But I know there won't be enough, obviously, there aren't enough uh, hospitals who are covered for uh, neurologists. And if I want to do it, I But I wish there could be more cases where they can have the sent or have information. Wherever they are sent to, you know, to every ward, if there could be some sort of just uh, idea what the is about, really. Well, thank you for that. Just so, to um, say thank you for the no, not at all. Thank you for your, for your comments. I, I think that um, there is a huge amount of work for the um, society to do. Um, I'm just a gopher. You know, I just support my wife and, and all the work that she does. But I do know that um, after this conference, the society is going to start thinking about what, it, what it's going to do next. How, and Andrew's already mentioned the question about trying to bring consultants and um, patients and sufferers together. Uh, the work that the, um, the, the, the support groups do around the country, and I know also one of the things that um, we want to do, but of course we need money to go with it, we want to do more work on the website to enable people who once they've got, and I might be stealing some of my wife's thunder, but to enable, to enable people to do just that. But in response to you, there is, there is hopefully going to be some work done, but um, I'm glad you found it useful. That's great. Any other questions? Yes? That's great. There's one right in the front here. Who's got a sprinter? Done. That's all I want. A lady in brown is now the lady in white trousers. Uh, I've had TM for nearly three years now, but it's only really in the last year that I've been having other problems as well. It um, usually happens, it happened last night as well, just before I'm like, about to go to sleep. I'll have something go off in my head and it will cause my head to like jolt. It's really weird. Or, you know, a leg will just. <laughs> pop out. Is that kind of normal? <laughs> just as you're dropping off to sleep. Just as you're dropping off to sleep. Yeah. Uh, it can be normal. It can be normal. Um, it could be uh, related to changing your medication. Um, uh, you should mention it to your neurologist or whoever's looking after you when you next go to see them. But it doesn't necessarily mean it's sinister if you're getting a little jump or leg twitch or something like that as you're dropping off, off to sleep. It can be within the realm of normal, it could be a bit more significant and you should discuss it with, with him who would 
know or her would know about your previous investigations, your medication changes, and so on. Um, if, if you develop any other symptoms of jumps or twitches or so on, I would bring forward that at a clinical point with them and not just wait till your next routine one, because it then may be a little bit more significant. Just to say, these are, those are very, very common. Um, and it happens to all of us. Everybody has these jumps or things when, when you're just falling asleep. You're just on the edge of falling asleep. But it's more common in those who are on medicines for transverse myelitis because every one of these medicines gets into the nervous system. And they affect how we fall off to sleep and how we stay asleep. And um, So those types of things, some people will even report these kind of very vivid uh, almost hallucinations, just as they're falling asleep, or these these sudden um, movements that occur, just as they're falling asleep. They can also occur just as you're waking up. You know, where you're not really awake, but you're just starting to become awake, and you have these startle episodes, or sometimes these vivid um, uh, hallucinations. So, typically, not not a, not a big deal. It kind of bothers some of people, but associated with the medicines more than anything. Do you have another question? Yeah, you have just, just one more. If you already had a previous autoimmune disorder, like I have a thyroid problem, but I've had it since I was a kid, if that one doctor said to me once, oh, that could be related to your TN, that could be a cause of why you got TN. It's just that curiosity, I suppose. No? Not a shaking heads at all. I don't think the thyroid disease has caused your TN, but um, uh, autoimmune disorders can clustered together and are known to be more common in women in any case. Okay, thank you very much. Is that in the great? Yeah. Oh, great. <laughs> <laughs> That's cool. Well, you, oh, you no. notice they're sitting a long way apart. <laughs> 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 uh, in, the, in the second row here. Uh, a number of the speakers have referred to how activity and phase activity does marvellous things. I just wondered whether, you know, like triggering, triggering with myelination we heard and doing marvellous things to axons and even, I think, promoting stem cells to produce neurons conceivably. I just wondered if it would be possible, say on the TM Society website, to actually, in layman's terms, to actually list all the benefits of activity and activity affairs to put, put it all together in one place. And I just wondered whether that was considered a good idea and who would do it. <laughs> I noticed my wife making some notes. Oh, okay. <laughs> so, Can I just answer it? Yeah, please do. Um, with, with all of these questions for the society, um, and this is aimed at medics as well as you, the audience, we are very, very small. It's taken all our energy over the last nine months to prepare for and uh, get this conference up and running. I want to do lots more, and I'll allude to that in, in just a minute. The fact of the matter is, we need more help. And I'm really throwing it back in your court, actually. Um, I know that Anna Schofield here is here somewhere, and she would really love to start a good newsletter. Um, we are, and we're not just talking about TM. Immediately we're going on to talking about um, activities, keeping fit. Nothing to do with TM really. She wants to have a gardening blog for people who are disabled to the point where they're in wheelchairs and can't garden anymore. There are so many little areas where I feel we can really begin to grow now. And this sort of thing actually is good. And I'd love the medics to use it a bit more. It looks as though and who really wants to, and if we can, we will, but we do need a bit more than a very small committee in London. Okay. Question right at the very back. Right behind you, Barry, that's it. Hopefully something most simple. Um, I find that when it's cold outside, I get incredibly stiff, more stiff than I would be if I was in a warm room. That was the first question. Can I do anything? Is it the medication? And secondly, I find in the evenings I've got like half a red face and half a red neck. Is that anything to do with TM and can I do anything about it? Who's going to take that one? Um, I'm going to pass the microphone on in a moment because I think there will be many people who want to contribute to those. But 
um, the uh, increased plasticity and increased stiffness spasms related to cold are well recognized. Um, uh, there isn't an easy solution to that. Um, it is a component of temperature sensitivity. Rather unfairly, so there are people who also find that they're weaker um, uh, when they're hot, when their body temperature is raised, either because of high ambient temperature or fever or exercise or so on. So finding the right temperature that you function best at is not, it's not one size fits all. You must avoid cold and be warm at all costs or you must be um, avoid heat and, and try and be cool at all costs. There's often some sort of midline way. Um, as to the hard face thing, I think to give a good answer that many of the neurologists up here in the panel would be wondering about the height of your lesion and, and so on and so forth. But uh, Danny, do you want to? Does anybody else want to chip in on this? Let Dan take it. I perfectly agree with your uh, temperature and specificity um, problem. And pretty much everybody who has plasticity will experience that winter ones are terrible for most people. Um, and I know I think the winter in England is probably a little longer than it is in, in, in southern Europe. Um, but um, so can you can you elaborate a little bit? Where what, what's what's your what's your condition? What's your uh, I've had TM since Christmas two thousand and four, and I think they said it was C seven, but they said it went all the way up. So all the, all the way up to, to where? They said it went from, from C7 all the way up to wherever the top is. I don't know, that's what it told me. <laughs> so, so, so most likely you have some of these pathways affected that are um, in charge for your temperature and sensation in the, in, in, in the face and the, partially maybe even the blood flow to the two parts of the face. So uh, we, we see that with epidemics with these very high lesions. Even, especially in kids, we have kids in, in, for example, TM in kids is usually much more longitudinally extensive than in, 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 in adults. Longitudinally extensive? Yes. Long. Define? Yeah. Um, so it can involve um, almost the whole spinal cord. Yeah. For kids. And, and in most cases, we see this extensive inflammation rather than just the focal, the focal ones. Um, and in those, especially unless we see inflammation, including the brainstem. So when you reach the brainstem, then they get some swallowing problems, they get some problems with the movement in their face, depending on how, how high up it goes. And then depending on how this feels, I mean, you may be left with some deficits. And it sounds like you probably have some of these deficits. Yeah, I have problems here and, and touch. Drives me nuts. I'm always trying to rip my clothes off because it's irritating. Well, so, so you're not alone. There are other people out there who have that too. Well, and, uh, that's... You just have to kind of look for changes of that over time. In a kind of a negative way. So if they were, because you want to always look for it, is there any evidence of any kind of progressive disease going on? Okay. But if, if, it, if it appears stable, I think. Okay. May I say something? Of course. <laughs> okay. Now, I would say it's something very easy to do. When it's a cold, it's better to wear a long joint to actually stop yourself having this plasticity. Because when you've got a long dress or something quite warm next to your clothes and maybe silk stockings or cotton stockings and then silk stockings on top, that actually really helps the cold business and you have less spasticity. And in the summertime, when it's hot, also people can't move. That also affects the spasticity and reduces the tone to the extent that you can't stand. And also it's best then to do wear really nice cotton clothes. I think polyester in it. And that also helps this process. I think with regard to the face and the neck, uh, it's important to note that uh, some of the nerves that come out of your spinal cord go to blood vessels. And so people uh, will often note that they have altered color or some swelling or things like that. And that actually reflects some altered function of the nerves that go to the blood vessels, which alters your ability to change blood flow. So people will often notice their feet get dark red and swollen. And in part, that is because of the transverse myelitis and an inability to regulate the, the, the blood vessels. And so people can often see other manifestations of this would be swings in blood pressure, which I bet you some of you have, where it's kind of challenging to maintain a constant blood pressure, and instead it may go up, it may go down. 
And all of that has to do with the nerves that go out to the blood vessels. And that's probably what this is. It just means that there's just an inability to kind of regulate those blood vessels. And so sometimes more blood, sometimes less blood. So it changes the color in the face. Question. Yes, there's a phone here. Yeah. Yeah. Like yeah. um, I'm a very keen walker, and I'm sure this is a problem that a lot of wheelchair people would like to have. However, I walk a lot to keep fit. But if we do a long walk and I have really good boots with proper orthotic bases uh, in, the, in the footwell, after an hour and a half of walking, I have a burning sensation to the point where I feel my feet could self-ignite. It's horrible. It is, it's almost brings tears to my eyes. It's that sort of pain. I don't generally have pain in my feet. I have very peculiar sensations, but uh, Simon will attest to this, that I usually have to stop, take my boots off, wait for several minutes, and put them on again. But then that that reaction comes back again. Any ideas? Then walk. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. No, I got one. I got one. No. <laughs> yes, yes, yes. I was just buying a panel at a time. Panel a little bit more about empowering you, actually. <laughs> Um, there are medications which might block some of those abnormal sensations. The difficulty might be that you, if you are normally asymptomatic and it's only exercise induced, you might not want to have those drugs on board all the time. And then it might, it, it might be possible to try a small dose just before you're due to do that long walk. Um, well, I was discussing, well, something like uh, pre gabapentin gabapentin, that sort of drug for a short term effect, low dose might, might help that. It's a sort of burning dysesthesia, is what you're describing. Do the, do the legs swell by the end of that? No. Uh, I, mean, I, I take the boots off, and I'm expecting to see blood red. Yeah. And they look they're normal. normal. They look normal. Yeah. And when you touch them, they're not that hot, but they, they feel hot too. Yeah, that's classic as a sort of neuropathic pain issue. I would, I mean, just in the, to cover all the bases, I would make sure, because you, you, you have TM and we think neurology. Uh, but there, there are a couple of medical issues too that can cause what's called clonication. Mm -hmm. So, because what you essentially do, you walk and then you take a break. You, because you stop, you take your shoes off, and then you put them back on, it's getting better. So, I would at least one time have your primary care physician take a look at the blood vessels as they go into your legs, make sure you don't, there's no, no, no narrowing of those arteries to get enough blood flow actually into the legs. Because if you talk to people, we had somebody here who did diabetes stuff, right? Speaking yesterday? Okay. Oh, yeah. So, for example, people with, with diabetes would have um, narrowing of the arteries, kind of atherosclerosis. Uh, you get what's called publication. Um, if you can go a short distance and it gets burning, bad pain in the feet, stop, take a break, and then they go further. And depending on how severe that is, that interval in between can be can have different, different lengths. So, bring it up with your primary care physician, have a look at the vessels. If that's not it, then I think the Different, uh, neuropathic pain medication approaches to do. Although my hunch is that it's a little bit of arthritis in the back, which everybody gets as we age. It's kind of to Daniel's point, right? That it may not be related to the transverse myelitis, but a little bit of arthritis in the low back, which we all get, can irritate these sensory nerves that they're coming out from the back. And as you walk for long periods of time, the increased blood flow into that region pinches that nerve a little bit and it causes a burning pain. It goes away when you rest. Some people will actually notice they kind of lean forward a little bit. It, it, it takes some of the pressure off and that, and that burning goes away. But, and you can check that just by a back x-ray or just, you know, a little MRI. But I, 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 hunt, I bet you it's just a little bit of arthritis, nothing too bad. Thank you. Question behind um, the ball. Um, um, I've been having a really, really bad problem the last couple of years of um, excessive sweating uh, for no apparent reason. I've been trying to link it in with, with something, you know, the hot things or whatever. Um, my GP tried to be on um, a thing that's used during um, the change of life for the sweating and I just found it didn't do the trick and the side effects were, were quite drastic. 
Um, I wonder if it's connected with the TM, and if so, what's the best way of treating it? Because it really is, um, I mean, it, it really is quite horrible. It doesn't feel good. And I find that I'm sweating so much, usually around the face and, and my neck, and I'm sweating so much that it cools me right down and I get chilled. Because I'm actually not hot. Sorry. Thank you very much for this question. I was waiting for that question for the past two days. <laughs> <laughs> so, who, who else has similar? So, let me, let me see. Yeah, so, how, how, yeah. um, how often does it happen? Sorry. How often does it happen? Oh, um, sorry. So, every day? Yeah. But what makes it better? I have no idea. I just sit and wait. Uh, and and how, how high was your TM? How high up was your TM? Well, I've had several attacks. Okay. Um, and the last one was quite high in the net. All right. Excellent. So, do you remember when I made the point yesterday that TM should be treated like a spinal cord injury? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I, think, I think he said it's far shooter out of the room before he said that. <laughs> and, and, and the reason is just like that. This is a common complication that you see with high spinal cord injuries. It's, uh, it's called autonomic cruise reflex here. And uh, who has ever heard that term? I missed it. Auto autonomic cruise reflex here? So I, had, I think I had four people. Who has had a transosmalitis at a level higher than T6? So you should all know about that. Because as you disrupt the, the information of the voluntary nervous system, like your strength, uh, your, your sensation, you also disrupt the flow of information from the brain to the involuntary nervous system. For example, in a uh, healthy person, if I step on your toe, and well, you, number one, you, you feel the sensation that it hurts, you, know, you may want to withdraw, but also if you step on it long enough, I mean, your heart rate will go up, your blood pressure will go up, but only to a certain level, because then the brain says, okay, you know, this is high enough, you can have to keep it in a safe place. In spinal cord injuries or transosmalitis above the level of T6, so T6 or higher, that inhibition can be impaired. So you have something aggravating your body from anywhere below that then raises your heart rate, raises your blood pressure, but the control mechanism is missing. So there is no root to this. So the pressure actually can't go up. Symptoms are usually severe sweating, uh, palpitations, headaches, pounding headaches, um, high blood pressures to the point where you can actually have a bleed in your brain and die. So this is a very serious thing. And so most people go into the, into the emergency room with like the severe symptoms and, uh, and physicians who are not familiar with this or patient doesn't educate the physician, um, they will start feeding the high blood pressure, the headache, whatever, whatever's there. But what you actually have to do is treat what's causing it. And so you have to learn that in about 80% of all these cases, they're triggered by a full bladder. So 80% is a full bladder, but 15% is constipation. <coughs> and so the other 5% are, are other things. So it could be an inborn toenail, it could be a, an appendicitis, uh, it could be a burn on your skin. And, and every single patient who has a lesion about that should know about this, because most physicians are not familiar with that. And when you go somewhere, you basically pretty much have to tell the doctors to say, you know, I think this could be autonomic use reflex here. Yeah, please see if you can figure out what this what this was triggered by. And so the mild symptoms of AD is this profuse sweating. And generally when you say above the neck, so above the, the, the injury. And uh, so you, you may you may have that. So what is the treatment? So the, well, the treatment is you have to find the, the factor that, that causes it. If it becomes an issue, there are medications that can actually suppress the autonomic nervous system a little bit, systemically. Um, um, one of the most common that we use is clonidine. I think, is it really? Yeah, yeah. So, clonidine, yeah. And it works actually great. It's a short acting pill, but there's a patch. Uh, but the first step is to try and work out what's causing it, yeah. because it's better to take away the underlying cause than to just take clonidine. Because generally, we don't treat AD um, unless it really becomes a huge issue for the patient. I mean, I have patients who say, you know, they sweat profusely and they can't do anything about it as soon as something pushes on them. 
If it becomes an issue, then, then we use medications. But other than that, we'll just find the trigger and try to avoid the trigger. It could be just tight clothing, tight clothing, tight shoes. And you say the trigger is 80% of the time is full bladder? Yep. And 15% is constipation? Correct. And 5% is everything else? Correct. <laughs> so, but that's why I mean, the easy one to look at is the first two first. Um, but it, it could be an infection, it could be a skin breakdown, yeah, yeah. a urinary tract infection can do it. And one of the things that you want to do is, in the middle of an episode, you just want to get a blood pressure, right? Because that's one of the ways that you can kind of confirm that this sweating is associated with this autonomic dysreflexia. In that case, your blood pressure, you would expect it to be quite high, right? Do you want to add to this question or is it a new um, question? No, no, I want to add to this, uh, please, if I may. And actually, I was going to bring it up if nobody else did. I work on the advice line of Swine Injuries Association. And the one thing I was going to say was that we do have a fact sheet on autonomic dysreflexia. So if you want to bombard me tomorrow morning after 9.30 when I've got my hat and coat off, um, I'll be glad to email or send a hard copy in the post. It's um, designed for spinal cord injury people rather than medics. Uh, I'm not a medic myself, but I'm a spinal cord injury trained nurse. And your chaps up there saying about uh, full bladder, on the practical um, and taking it back one stage, we find that it's, it's equipment, first of all, that causes a problem. So it could be a kink in the tubing if you have an indwelling catheter, for example. And certainly, um, I would agree with what was said, um, a constipation situation and tight clothing, hot weather. And also, what happens sometimes in spinal cord injury centres is that a high lesion may experience an induced AD so that they actually know what it feels like when they get it. And not all people, uh, T6 and above, get AD, but when they do, they know about it and, and they normally know what triggers it. And we have a little card as well, which you can keep with you if you do suffer AD, and you can wave it at the medics in uh, emergency situations and say, I've got AD, you know, this is what it is, and uh, help. Do you have are you prepared to publicly give us your email address then, so that people yep. can contact you? Uh, yep. Um, my personal one is J, just uh, the letter J um, <laughs> dot Sinclair. S I N C L A R. Yeah, no E on the end. Yep. At spinal dot co dot uk, or you can go through the website or the um, reception. That's fantastic. I can certainly that. I've got drinks. That's fantastic. Thank you. Thank you very much indeed. That's brilliant. Yeah, the fact sheet sounds well worth well getting. There's a lady in multicolored top on the my left by the window, and then behind her. Um, just wanted to ask a question about the new research that's being done in. Um, um, CCSBI and what your thoughts are on that. I do know mostly it's been done in NS patients, but I do know of someone who has had it done for TM and has had very good results so far. She's 12 months on and has pretty much got rid of all her spasticity. Her weakness is much, much better and her fatigue is better. And so just wondering what your thoughts are on that research. So there is really no scientific basis for this. That's the bottom line as of now. Why do I say that? It began as a, just a, a, a small report by Professor Zamboni um, and uh, in treating his own, his wife. And then it caught on and it was taken up predominantly by vascular surgeons who don't know anything about MS, uh, by radio, radiologists who don't know the understanding the mechanisms of MS. And uh, the theory is that venous congestion because of blocks in the neck veins lead to increased iron overload or whatever, leads to MS. This is, doesn't really stand to reason of the years <coughs> of MS knowledge and doesn't stand to reason at all. And um, 
because of his public, uh, public outcry and demands for it, the neurology community has done pretty good studies now in the last two, three years. And uh, the bottom line is MS patients have no, uh, no more venous abnormalities as compared to normal population. And uh, there is really no substance in it so far. Um, and there are good studies. And uh, the general opinion is don't go for it uh, because patients have died in the process. Some people have, you know, people who have done the procedures, who perform, let's put it this way, a lot of money has changed hands. <laughs> I, I completely agree. Yeah, that's a very comprehensive answer. I would endorse that. I think if you um, want to contribute to uh, good research in, in, in TM, then there are many more fruitful areas that you could put your money. I would not, I would not spend it on this procedure at all. I, I don't think anybody else in the panel would disagree. I think this sort of looks like total support for that. Right. There's another question somewhere towards the back. Yes, on your left, Barry. There we go. Hi guys, thank you very much for coming over. It's been really interesting. Um, I've had TM twice, one in 2002 and 2004, six months after I had my baby girl. Um, the only question that I have for Dr. Ducker is, you said yesterday in your presentation that to get TM after being, um, being pregnant is very unlikely. It happened to me and I'd like to know why. And on top of that, I've been told by my neurologist that it takes up to five years for TM to clean out your system. Could you confirm that? And if you could confirm that, could I label myself saying I'm TM free in the near future? So the issue with pregnancy, so um, uh, what I meant to convey is really that during pregnancy, it's unlikely or it's less likely to occur, transverse myelitis. And that's because you're, you're immunosuppressed during the pregnancy. But after pregnancy, certainly in MS, there's an increased risk of MS attacks. And so the idea is that your immune system is kind of rebounding back. Now, was your tra first transverse myelitis after the baby was born? No, I had transverse myelitis 2002, C1, C2, C3. I believe it was in all those three areas. I was paralyzed from the neck completely down. What was the relationship to pregnancy, though? Um, with, with the pregnancy, um, I was told that the inflammation actually occurred back in the, in the same area, C1, C2, C3. So the lesions were back there again. I had an epidural and that completely failed. They did not work at all. I went through 28 hours of labor, even though they know my history about my TM. Um, so obviously I had to go for a bunch of C-section. So I'm just putting it down to the basis that because of all the hard labor that I had to go through and everything, it obviously put strain on my body. But after listening to your presentation yesterday, it's just made me think again. It's like, you know, what made, you know, what made me have my relapse again? It was in three, three, three months after I had Phoebe. Three months gap? Yeah. That is a bit unusual. But basically we know more about this from, from MS studies. Now, when the woman is pregnant, her body is naturally immunosuppressed. It's got to be because obviously she's, she's carrying a developing um, embryo. After pregnancy, the immune system reverts back to normal. It is known in MS that if you take the pregnancy year, which is the nine months when you're pregnant, and the three months thereafter, that 12 months, it isn't that MS, uh, sorry, pregnancy increases your risk of an MS attack, but it changes the timing of it. So it moves it out of that nine months when you're naturally immunosuppressed, unfortunately compacted into the three months after delivery, which is really a disastrous time, clearly, to have a relapse. Oh, absolutely, it yeah. change your overall risk in that 12 months. And if you weren't destined, as it were, to have a relapse in that period, it doesn't bring one on, but it does alter the timing. And I think that's really what you were alluding to yesterday, and that is well understood from the research. So I would, I would support the overall comments that Doug made yesterday. Right. So I'm calling myself one in a million TM sufferer then, yeah, Dr. Kerr? Say that again? So I could call myself a one in a million TM sufferer then. You can. Thank you very much. <laughs> And who's just um, playing on the internet? The first lady in the front here, just by the doors. There we go. This one on the right. And then there's one down the dark. 
actually, it was more of a, a follow-on from that one. It was just to say that I um, had TM in 2002 following the birth of my first child. But I did actually go on to have a second child. And in my pregnancy, well, my second child, my TM symptoms did indeed go away. I just wanted to confirm that. Can I just uh, drive home the point I was telling before about CCSVI? This is the website, CCSVI and MSC UK. You can see all the all about it. And uh, go to the, you can see parcels to go on top. And at the bottom you see there's a link. The only place for your cheap bathroom deals. <laughs> you see that? Cheap bathroom deals. <laughs> bathrooms. <laughs> so you can see the reliability of the sources. <laughs> You can find humor in everything, which is great. Nobody here is laughing. There was a question down, ladies and gentlemen, yes? And I think that might be the last one. Um, yeah, I'd just like to say thanks. It's been really illuminating for me. Um, I had TM in January 2007. Um, I just wanted to just say, say something that back up something that Yvonne had said is that I can stand and walk a bit, but I've got I, then I fall over. Um, but even the, and I keep trying obviously, but even the little bits I do, I get pain worse than it is already in the soles of my feet. Similar, shorter time, but I mean I feel like I'm dip, either dipped in. I call it dipped in the deep fat fryer from the waist down, or I'm in the freezer from the waist down. It's one or the other. But I find that I forget um, Professor Young, you gave the name to it. Alidilia. Alidilia. Was it Alidilia that you were doing? So, so sensations any, yeah, are it's which should or clothes. Right. Yeah. Um, anyway, my question is it's a bit of a wild card. Is I, um, shortly after I had. My TM attack, I developed very severe bilateral tinnitus and I was wondering if there was, it was just another short straw I drew or whether there could be any connection. There's nothing wrong EMT wise and the um, auditory consultant I saw said it was probably something to do with the auditory nerve because there's nothing wrong with my hearing or hearing or anything. And I, I just wondered if there was any connection possibly. Well, I guess there will be a number of thoughts from the neurologists on the panel. Your hearing's normal, you didn't have balance problems, you never had the tiger. It's just straight to the it's bilateral. I have episodes of having tinnitus oh, right. quite a long time before. Okay, so I think then it could relate to that. The other things that people want to know about is your family history. And finally, if you had particular medications when you were acutely ill with your TM, for example, certain antibiotics given for protracted periods can, can affect the order. Yeah. Any other? That's right. No, I think it's very good on that. Why did you ask, did she have vitiligo? Vertigo. Yes. Vertigo. Yeah. Sorry, okay. okay. Yeah. I misheard. No, I think that's probably it. Yeah. Very quick one. Before I come to this conference, I was like told that um, a recurrence of TM would be quite rare, but actually there seems to be quite a lot of people in this room that have had recurrences. And uh, to be honest, I'm a bit more worried now than before I came here. What would you say the possibility of recurrent TM would be? I know it varies an awful lot. I'm not any, um, I'm incomplete. I mean, it is rare. Um, it is, uh, it, you know, it depends on some of the features of the acute myelitis attack, meaning the, the length of the lesion, what the spinal fluid showed, whether there was uh, any brain findings, what the, what the eyes look like. Um, so there's a bunch of factors that go into that risk assessment in terms of whether or not somebody is likely to recur. And we think we could give a, a, a general idea, you know, 10% kind of is across the board. And if you have several of those features, it might be higher than that. If you have none of those features, it's clearly much lower than that. Um, I, I think it is kind of overrepresented here. I don't know how many, uh, how many patients have had transverse myelitis. Can, can we just see a show of hands? All right, now keep your hands up. Uh, except what I want is the, the people who have had recurrence only. 
Keep your hands up. About yeah, so it's probably about that that number, about ten percent. No, it's good to see that. Yeah. Well, that's um, <laughs> yeah, that's a, a good a good show of hands. Here we go. Okay, can we get Barry? Um, the recurrence then, oh sorry, the recurrence, Dr. Kerr, should, does that have to be diagnosed uh, from MRI as a definite recurrence, or is it purely symptoms that, from the original no, lesion? It's, but, so it's, it's challenging, right, because a lot of people will have fluctuations in symptoms that come and go over time and would not qualify as a relapse or a recurrence. Right? It's, it's an infection, it's fatigue, it's travel, things like that that may exacerbate the previous symptoms that had waned a bit over time and now become a bit more present. Right? So one of the things symptomatically that would suggest the possibility of a relapse rather than just a reactivation of old symptoms is something new in a new distribution, a new symptom, weakness in a limb that wasn't there before something like that. But you really do want to uh, confirm this by imaging or spinal fluid. And the reason is uh, because the implications are quite significant. Because if you've had two, chances are you may have a third. And therefore, a therapy to decrease the risk of a third attack would potentially be warranted. So, it's, so when you have this, it's really important to kind of figure out, is this a relapse? Or is this just a reactivation of old symptoms? In which case, I wouldn't go on a medicine because it's not a true relapse. So it's important. It's hard to get your medics often to take that evaluation and do the whole evaluation again. But it has pretty big implications with whether or not you would go on some chronic therapy for that. Thank you. Thank you. We've got emergency questions here, now. <laughs> <laughs> or do you want to leave the room? What I wanted to say was sometimes they say if you have more than one attack of TM, it can lead to multiple cirrhosis. Is this correct or is it just hearsay? So, no, it's not exactly correct. I mean, people can have recurrent transverse myelitis and it is just recurrent transverse myelitis. Or the transverse myelitis episodes could just be part of, of MS. The recurrent transverse myelitis episodes could be part of a systemic autoimmune disease like lupus or Sjogren's or things like that. So in the context of a true relapse, several things need to be done. One, is this part of multiple sclerosis? And the brain MRI would help with that, even though you may not have any symptoms referable to the brain. And your only symptoms are referable to the spinal cord, a brain MRI is helpful. Why? Because you have silent demyelination in the brain. You rarely have silent demyelination in your spinal cord. It's usually very apparent to you. But not personally to you, but most of us don't use most of our brain. Right? So the, the demyelination events that occur in the brain are usually silent. 80% of them are. So that's why you need a brain MRI, because you couldn't have told me that you had a demyelinating event in your brain. The spinal fluid can also be helpful. So it doesn't mean that it's part of MS, but it certainly should be investigated if a second attack has occurred. Right, ladies and gentlemen, um, I'm going to do something.